All right, testing? Yeah, all right, good. All right, welcome everyone uh, here to Council Chambers. We're about a minute away from starting the meeting, uh, so just giving you a heads up instead of every, you know, us scrambling to try to get on air. Appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Uh, I'll tell you, we did the best we could to accommodate the crowd that we were expecting. Uh, so we did, we do have a couple lines out here, double deep in the hall. We have the auxiliary room full and there's still some carryover in the lobby. But uh, we've worked to accommodate the best that we can. Do appreciate that with the large crowd here, though I hear right now that we've only got about uh, 12 uh, planned speakers. We are, you know, we're obviously willing to, to stay here and listen to absolutely everybody. I think we understand as a council where everybody stands. I would say that the, the bottom line is you can support those speakers simply by applauding or by, you know, basically uh, uh, standing up and saying, yeah, we, we support that. And that'll keep us moving along and get us all home before midnight. Um, but, uh, and that's not making light. I'm truly not trying to make light of the subject matter. So like I said, we uh, basically have done it our best to accommodate everybody and we want you to feel welcome here. Uh, and we will stay here as long as uh, the community wants to speak. All right, with that said, Randy, we're ready to start. Okay, welcome to those that have joined us here at Council Chambers, as well as those that are viewing from home. Uh, we have a relatively large crowd here this evening at uh, uh, City Council Chambers. Uh, I'll call this meeting to order, and this is the regular meeting of the Pocosin City Council for Monday, December 9th of uh, 2019. If you could all please rise, I'll lead you in the invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and for the many blessings we've received in our city over the last month. As we deliberate the issues before us this evening, we ask for a portion of your wisdom that as we consider those issues that we take into account all of the citizens that we represent. We ask for your continued presence for those in our military, especially those in our ser that serve us in our foreign lands while we sleep safely here in the United States. As well, we ask for your presence that they be felt by our public safety officials, be it their, if they're our federal, state, or city. In all of that, we ask in your son's name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, we have a couple of... Uh, early housekeeping items to take care of, and this is one of the great things about being in the city of Pocosin, something that we do that uh, other cities probably uh, do not do, and that is welcome our new employees. We do have several new employees within our city, uh, several within the police department, several within the, the fire department, so no, we didn't just bring the police and fire department because we expected a large turnout, <laughs> okay? But, uh, and we also have a public uh, utilities worker. So I think they'll be a little bit overwhelmed, but I'm, I'm okay to overwhelm them. Um, so Captain Waddell, if you will introduce the new uh, police officers for us. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Josh, can you hear that microphone? No, I'm sorry, I'm talking to our board up. <coughs> All right, so here's our three newest employees that we have with the police department. Uh, first is going to be uh, Michael Wiggins. He is a native of California. He comes to us uh, with 
uh, I believe it was over 10 years experience from the Pascagoula, Mississippi Police Department. Come on and up, Mike. Uh, he, yep. he uh, attended abbreviated academy for us and has just recently been released to independent patrol. Great. Officer Wiggins. There you go, sir. All right. You want to say something again? Oh, I'm, I wasn't prepared for that. Sorry. Um, yes, I'm Michael Wiggins. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and grow with the city. Um, I've been blessed. I have a really hot redheaded wife over there. I've uh, I got two kids, one's in college and one's here. Um, I'm just really excited to be here and thank you for the opportunity. We're glad to have you with us. Thank you. Second one I'm going to introduce is a uh, Pocosin native. Uh, has roots right here in the community and uh, is Brandon Hargrave. And he's also been with us for a few months uh, on independent patrol. And Brandon, would you like to say something? Sure. How y'all doing? Hey, good to see you, Brandon. Good. Um, I'm Brandon Hargrave. Grew up down here. Um, Coast native. Graduated 2005 Coast High School. Proud to be here and work for the city. Yeah. We're glad to have you. And finally, we have Officer Summer Langwell. Uh, she is a military child, so she moved around a little bit. Uh, I think she claims Alabama, okay? And uh, she has law enforcement uh, in her family, and I think that's what drew her to this line of work. This is Summer. Uh, did you watch the Auburn game? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so I'm born semi-raised in Alabama. Um, we moved here with the military and just never left. Um, I have two kids and came to Pocosin because it's a small town similar to where I grew up. Um, so kind of the same, just the same environment. And I appreciated that. It's easier to get to know your community and have a relationship with them and not get lost in all the, the traffic of everything. So it has been my pleasure to work for the city. Great. We're thrilled to have you. Then uh, we have some new fire, to fire employees and Battalion Chief Smith, if you'll come and introduce them. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, Mr. Manager, distinguished members of City Council. I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Christopher, there he is, Christopher Walkowich, firefighter medic. I'm not present. Hello, everybody. Everybody back here. Um, I've got 13 years in the fire service. I started in the city of Hampton, um, went to Norfolk International for a few years. Me and my wife and kids moved here for the school system. We love it here. Um, it reminds us of Fox Hill where I grew up, um, and I'm happy to be here and serve the city. And I also think that guns save lives, so we're in good company. Okay. Thank you. Take care. And last but not least, we have a utilities worker and Chad Kajarek. <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, you know, I, I spelled this name up. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Manager, and uh, Council Members. Uh, I'm here to introduce uh, Mr. Sean O'Meara. He is from Newport News, has a strong mechanical background. Um, he has an electrical background and a generator background. So all three things that we need to work on our sewer pump station. So we're glad to have him. He's been here about three weeks. So, Sean. All right. I appreciate the opportunity. My name is Sean O'Meara. Um, I'm born and raised 757 Newport News. I'm looking to move here. Um, I promise to give everything I can and try my hardest to keep this train rolling like it has been. Okay. We really appreciate having you. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And now who, I don't know who the lucky individual is that get, gets to give us our, the re reports of uh, our audit, but uh, this is an audit presentation on our finances. Correct. And uh, if you'll introduce what, uh, how that's done and we'll move forward. Absolutely. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Member, City Manager, I have Logan Booth here. He is our audit manager with Cherry Becker. They perform our audits each year. Um, you received in your package the CAFR which produces our financial statements for our audience here, the audience list at home. We have hard copies in the libraries, city manager's <coughs> office, the finance department, as well as online. So if you go to the finance link and you pull up our financial statements, you'll find the current statement. 
Um, without further ado, Logan's here to present you with the findings of the audits and answer any questions you may have. Okay, Logan, okay. welcome. Good evening, Council and um, members of the audience, and thank you guys for your time. My name is Logan Booth, and I'm, the, as Tanya mentioned, the audit manager. I've been lucky enough to serve the city for the past six years, and um, I'm here to present the results of the financial statement and compliance audits. Um, so the audit includes not only the audit of the financial statements, but as well as the compliance audit of the audit of public accounts um, in the, of the Commonwealth of Virginia, as well as the um, federal grants under the Uniform Grant Guidance. So in conducting our audits, we test the significant balances, um, transactions, and required disclosures of the financial statements, and we present an opinion on whether the, those financial statements are material, materially accurate. Um, as part of our um, audit, we gain an understanding of internal controls, and while we do not issue a report on those inter internal controls, we would be required to communicate any material um, deficiencies or any significant dis deficiencies of those internal controls. Um, so I'm pleased to result that based on our audit, we issued three clean, unmodified opinions on the financial statements. Um, however, there was one matter of material weakness, and that is in relation to um, financial reporting of the grants and the schedule of expenditures of federal awards. And there's more information that you can find related to those findings in um, the schedule of, or of findings and questions calls located in the back of the CAFR. Um, so in addition to the results of the financial statement audit and the compliance audit, there are some required communication items that are required to be communicated to you all as part of the auditing standards. Um, there were no accounting policy changes or any significant changes to accounting principles affecting the city in 2019. Um, we did not have any disagreements or any difficulties with management as part of the conducting the audit of the financial statements. Uh, there are certain accounting estimates that require management judgment as part of the preparation of the financial statements, and those include the allowance for doubtful accounts, um, the actuarially computed pension and other post-employment benefit liabilities, and then the depreciation expense on capital assets. Um, as part of the audit, we did not note any audit adjustments that materially affect the financial statements, and we did not note any adjustments that, that would have been required to materially correct them. Um, we are not aware of any consultation of any external accountants within the city, and uh, we are not aware of any relationships with our firm that would impair our independence of the city. Um, and then lastly, uh, we received our management representation from the city as part of our issuance of the financial statements on November 25th. So with that, I know I kind of covered it pretty quickly, so if there are any questions on anything, I'd be happy to address. Council, any questions? Okay, seeing none. Hey, appreciate your service, uh, what y'all do for us. And so uh, for those that are seated in the audience or those listening at home, Basically, that's a good report to us. Yes. Okay. Clean audit. Is that it's a clean audit. Yep. Uh, I know there's a lot of technical jargon in there, but that basically means that uh, we account for your tax dollars very closely, and we do the right things with them, and uh, uh, basically a lot of grants so uh, this year yep. uh, from the federal government, and we appreciate uh, those, and we will try to uh, make adjustments on how we account for those. Certainly. Okay. Already. Thank you, Council. Thank you. All right, next item on the agenda is uh, probably what a lot of folks uh, came for. We're actually the next two. There's a one break in the middle where we do a little uh, uh, housekeep housekeeping. Uh, the, uh, this is the audience for visitors. We do have a large turnout tonight. Um, I do not have the speaker cards in here, if I could get those. Um, I will tell you that we're going to step out of uh, order just a little bit. And uh, the first thing is that I want to read to you, uh, or have the city clerk read to you, the um, resolution that council will be considering as item one of the agenda. And uh, then uh, I'll, I'll speak again before I open the audience for visitors, but at that time, anybody's uh, welcome to, to address council. But Evie, if you could do that, please. Certainly. 
A resolution of the Cosin City Council to support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Whereas the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And whereas Article 1, Section 13 of the Constitution of Virginia provides that a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained to arms is the proper natural, natural and safe defense of a free state, Therefore, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That standing armies in time of peace should be avoided as dangerous to liberty, and that in all cases the military should be under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. And whereas certain legislation introduced in the 2019 session of the Virginia Nas General Assembly and certain legislation introduced into the current session of the United States Congress could have the effect of infringing on the right of law-abiding citizens to keep and bear arms as guaranteed by the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution and whereas the Council of the City of Pocosin is concerned about the passage of any bill containing language would, which would be interpreted as infringing the rights of the citizens of the city of Pocosin to keep and bear arms, or could begin a slippery slope of restrictions on the Second Amendment rights of the citizens of the city of Pocosin, and whereas the Council of the city of Pocosin wishes to express its deep commitment to the rights of all law-abiding citizens of the City of Pocosin to keep and bear arms, and whereas the Council of the City of Pocosin wishes to express opposition to any law that would unconstitutionally restrict the rights under the Second Amendment of the citizens of the City of Pocosin to bear arms, and whereas the Council of the City of Pocosin wishes to express its intent to oppose within the limits of the Constitution of the United States and the Commonwealth of Virginia, any efforts to unconstitutionally restrict such rights and to use such legal means at its disposal to protect the right of citizens to keep and bear arms, including through legal action, the power of appropriation of public funds, and the right to petition for redress of grievances. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the City of Pocosin, Virginia, does hereby express its intent to uphold the Second Amendment rights of the citizens of the City of Pocosin, and hereby declares itself a constitutional city, in that the Council of the City of Pocosin is committed to upholding all constitutional rights of its citizens, and that the Council of the City of Pocosin hereby declares its intent to impose the unconstitutional restrictions on the right to keep and bear arms through such legal means as may be expedient, including without limitation court action. Okay. Thank you. So now you know what, uh, what the city of Pocosin is considering. So I'm going to open the audience for visitors. Uh, I do have uh, 12 speakers that have signed up. If you've changed your mind and you don't want to speak, that's acceptable as well, but I'm going to call you in order of how you signed up. So the first name I have is uh, Mr. Jason Hayden. 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 Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Cities of Pocosin, uh, Citizens of Pocosin. Um, Firearm safety. Jeff Cooper has said it best. If violent crime is to be curbed, it is only the intended victim who can do it. The felon does not fear the police. He fears neither judge nor jury. Therefore, he must be taught to fear his victim. In 2007, Amanda Collins, a University of Nevada, Reno student, was brutally raped at gunpoint in the parking garage on her way back after a night class. The police station was in the garage 100 yards away. She was not able to conceal carry as she had a permit to do because the university would not let her. That gentleman, and I use the term very, very loosely, went on to rape two other women and kill one of them. Ms. Collins feels like if she had been able to carry that night, those things would not have happened. In 2013, in Houston, Texan, a 15-year-old boy used his father's AR-15 to protect himself, his 12-year-old uh, sister, and their home from multiple intruders. Just last month, an eight-month pregnant woman 
use an AR-15 to protect her family, including her husband, from two intruders, one of which was pistol whipping her husband. These are just a couple of examples in where firearms in the hands of law-abiding citizens saved lives and did what police officers, even though they do great jobs, can't do, which is stop crimes in progress. The average time for 911 response is 12 minutes. The average time for a burglary or home invasion is 8 to 10 minutes. Amanda Collins' rate lasted 8 minutes. And in some cases, the police aren't able to respond because they don't get the call, like what happened with Ms. Collins. The simple fact is that firearms in the hands of law-abiding citizens saves lives and prevents crimes. Just imagine how many rapes, sexual assaults could be prevented if the criminals who do that kind of thing would have to worry that the woman they're stalking is carried. Okay. Like a bad straw man argument, the incoming legislator is blaming the wrong thing under the guise of trying to make, you know, prevent mass shootings and make things safer. A middle of the road estimate is that there are approximately 15 million semi-automatic rifles in America today. Since 1982, that's 35 years, less than 30 have been used in a mass shooting. If you do the math, that's 0.0002%. According to the Crime Prevention Center, between 1950 and 2016, though, 97.8% of all mass shootings happen, have happened in a gun-free zone where law-abiding citizens cannot protect themselves. In 20 states that allow teachers to be armed, there have no, been no school shootings. Chicago, New York, London, Detroit, Baltimore all have strict gun laws, and yet they have high crime rates. In contrast, to show the statistics, 250,000 people are estimated to die from medical errors that are preventable each year. That is 985 people a day. I'm, excuse me, I apologize. That's 685 people a day, which is more than all the people that have died from a mass shooting in the past 15 years put together, which is 655. To say this again, the hands, guns in the hands of law-abiding citizens are not the problem. Even your average teenager, high school student, knows that you don't stop drunk driving by banning cars. Apparently, this is more than the politicians in Richmond know right now. Bills proposed by the legislation would have effect of attacking the rights of law and bodies and sitting under the guise of safety. The red flag law denies the right of due process to confront one's accuser and to be considered innocent until proven guilty. The assault firearms law ban is designed to strip law-abiding citizens of commonly owned and easily operated hunting and defensive firearms. Amy Swearer, a member of the Heritage Foundation, testified to Congress that her elderly mother was able to make a fist-sized grouping at 20 yards after minimal training with an AR-15, yet she had easy, earlier tried to use a handgun and could barely hit the target. Even government agencies have declared the AR-15 a personal defense weapon. The bill against paramilitary activities uh, is so overreaching that even a karate class could be considered a paramilitary activity since it teaches the people in the class how to use techniques that may injure or cause death for somebody. This law sounds more like something from the Intolerable Acts of England in 1775 and before than something in the state that cheered, give me liberty or give me death, and whose motto is, six semper tyrannis. To conclude, the gun laws that the state is looking at to put in effect will not make our city safer. In fact, they will make them more dangerous. Not only will they mean that in many cases those that would take advantage of unarmed citizens have a greater opportunity to do so, some of these laws will make those law-abiding citizens criminals just with a stroke of a pen. Our founding fathers understood that it was the responsibility of every man to protect his life and liberty. And that is why that with the Second Amendment and with Article I, or, or, I'm sorry, um, the Virginia Constitution, they enshrined the right to bear arms so that they could, provide, they could protect those rights that are most dear, life, liberty, speech, assembly, against all enemies. 
all of which these rights in some way, shape, form, or fashion are targeted by these bills. To usurp these rights from the gov for the gov to usurp these right for the government's sake is to make citizens dependents, slaves even to this authority, taking away citizens' rights to protect their life, liberty, family, and property by creating laws that criminalize the very instrument which makes this possible as not only un-American and inhumane, it's tyrannical. This is why Bacosan must join our neighboring counties and cities of states proclaiming that they will not enforce or recognize laws that go against the very rights and liberties of its citizens ingrained in the fabric of our society through our constitutions. Thank you very much for your time. Have a good evening. Thank you, Jason. All right, Mr. Dale Simmons. This is a game time decision. I guess it's game time. <laughs> um, I'm here. Hello, everybody. I guess everybody knows me except for a couple up there. Um, being a retired police officer from this city, I have more concerns than, than just that. This is going to pass. No doubt in my mind, it probably is going to pass in Richmond. What I'm asking you to do is not enforce them. Don't have my brothers that I worked with 32 years come to my door to get my gun. Three of the guns I own, I purchased. I carried on duty. One of them was given to me upon my retirement. Come Ju January, July the 1st, three of the four I purchased will make me a felon. I bought all mine so I could pass them on to my kids. Once I pass them on to my kids, without doing the proper background check, I'm a felon. I'm asking you to please, please don't enforce what they're proposing up there. Don't have Pocosin police officers going door to door to get these people's guns. Just don't do it. Yeah. As Trump is draining the swamp, unfortunately, some of it's worse than to Paco uh, but into Virginia. And it's not good. But it's going to happen, no doubt in my mind. Hey, thank you, Dale. Uh, Mr. Henry Ayer. <clears throat> Council, Mayor, I really I like Dale. I wasn't going to speak tonight. If I had, I wore my Dallas Cowboy hat, so y'all could all be impressed. But <laughs> I honestly really wasn't going to speak tonight. But uh, I got to thinking about a story, and I'm going to tell you a story. And I do know I'm pr probably preaching to the choir at this point. Um, but this message really is one I hope that gets to Richmond somehow. My wife, and the gentleman was talking about it earlier, my wife was um, just about eight months pregnant, a couple miles down the road, 32 years ago. About 2 o'clock in the morning, someone came in our home. New home, just moved in, had no deadbolts. We had actually talked about it that night. She said, I believe someone's in the house. So I get up, go to the top of the steps, and sure enough, there's a gentleman, I guess it was a man, with a flashlight looking around the house. I immediately go back to tell her to dial 911. She dialed 919, 119. She couldn't quite get 911 out, but she, she finally did. So the first pistol I get to was a 357 that wasn't loaded. That's changed now. The next gun I got to was loaded. I get to the top of the steps, fire off a couple of shots. He gets away. Obviously, I'm not a very good shot. I'm better now. Don't try it. <laughs> so the officers come to my home, my wife visibly shaking, eight months pregnant, first child. It's just a couple miles down the road. He comforts us, lets us, uh, tell, sorry it happened, did we feel justified in the shooting? That was it. Let me fast forward that now. Listen, if that happens today. And it can happen, and I envision it, it could happen. The shooting takes place. The officer asks me what type of weapon I use, can I see your magazine? I show him my magazine. It's an assault firearm, is what they call it, based on SB16. That would have me charged with a class six felony. I'd be a convicted felon. If I lived through the attack that might have happened on my wife had I not been armed that night, I would have got out of jail to probably see my child's first birthday. 
That's what's going to happen if these laws pass. And as Dale said, I believe they are. We have to make a lot of noise. The delegates, the people that are supporting this, they need to be called and contacted. We, we talk a lot, but are we acting a lot? We have got to call. We have got to make noise. You know, men have been searching for freedom for since before time, I guess. But 1215, the Magna Carta, I guess it started. And our declaration and our Bill of Rights kind of follow suit with the Magna Carta when our declaration or our Bill of Rights were ratified in 1788. But they affirmed certain, the declaration affirmed certain inalienable rights to us. What's going to happen now is with the passage of these laws, these rights, we are going to be infringed upon. And we were told we would not be infringed upon. So what I'm here to say today, and I'm, this is what I'm hoping gets to Richmond, and I, I think I, I speak for the vast majority of the folks that are here. If they pass these laws and infringe upon my inalienable rights, I will not comply. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Tim Anderson. Um, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, so my name is Tim Anderson. I'm an attorney here in, Vir uh, well, not here, but in Virginia Beach. Uh, I own a gun shop in Virginia Beach. And <clears throat> about three or four weeks ago, <clears throat> I started blogging on Facebook about what's going on in Richmond. And it was mostly just to get people uh, to, to understand what the bills uh, that were being proposed were happening. Uh, that has turned into a almost once a day blogging event and uh, a quarter of a million people a week are watching the videos. Uh, because of that, I'm here. Uh, I was asked to come here to speak to you from a, a unique point of view that I have as a Second Amendment uh, attorney, as a gun shop owner, and uh, somebody who has uh, been involved in the legislative process for most of my career. So... Uh, the interloper is here, but I'm hoping to bring you some perspective. Uh, a Second Amendment sanctuary city is a political statement. They don't change the laws of Virginia. They simply make the local, they tell the local police on how to effectively use the police resources in enforcing the laws. As such, they do not violate the Dillon Rule. As you know, the Dillon Rule says that localities can't make laws above what the state does. Richmond has granted discretion to the localities for policing purposes. The laws that Richmond is set to pass in whatever form will have this theme, making certain firearms legal in Virginia today illegal in the future, making magazines commonly found in most pistols that are legal today illegal in the future, giving police the authority to seize firearms off of the allegations of a coworker or neighbor that someone is unstable without any medical evidence to support that allegation. All of these laws are going to be deemed legal. Yes, they will, at least according to the Fourth Circuit, but I ask you, are they right? The Fourth Circuit has upheld Maryland's assault ban in the case of Colby versus Hogan. As such, we are not going to see federal courts enjoin these new laws. This is a political fight that the courts are going to step away from as they have in New Jersey, Maryland, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and California. Giving us time and sanctuary to change the political landscape of Virginia by recognizing laws are laws, but active policing of those laws is up to the discretion of the localities. Give us time to see if the United States Supreme Court will hear the case of Warman versus Healy, wherein once and for all the Supreme Court can weigh in on if civilians can own modern sporting rifles and high capacity magazines. Give us time without the police kicking in the door to mobilize the citizens. There were 347 homicides in Virginia that were caused by gunfire of a population of eight and a half million. That is less than four one hundredth of a percent per capita of being killed by a criminal with a gun. Over 2.4 million people own guns in Virginia. 347 of them have used them criminally. That makes 14 one hundredth of a percent 
of criminals using guns. The system we have makes us safe. The state does not have a compelling interest in addressing an emergency. 819 people died in the Commonwealth in 2017 from DUIs. 1,547 overdosed on drugs last year alone. 872 people died from falls. You have a two times better chance of falling off of a ladder than you do, and dying, than you do of being shot and killed in Virginia. You have a two times better chance of being killed by a drunk driver tonight than you do of being shot by a criminal with a gun. You have a four times better chance of knowing someone who has overdosed than being shot in Virginia. We do not have a gun problem or a gun crisis in Virginia. We have a false narrative pushed by a gun-hating left agenda. Use the truth as you see fit. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Dale Blankenship. Howdy, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Manager, City Council. Thanks for having us here. Um, the biggest thing that I see is one of the, the, the first things the Democrats call for is a good first step in gun control. So this is, if this is just the first step, I don't want to see what the rest are going to be. They're not going to be good. And, and like everybody said, and like you know, uh, the governor's already said he will sign anything that you get to him. So I don't know if all of the, the proposals will make it as they are right now. I don't expect they'd change much, but I'm sure they're all going to get signed through. I got four pages of stuff here, so I'm not going to bore you with all that. But uh, a lot of things they have about the red flag laws. Um, Garen Wintemute, who's a researcher at UC Davis uh, at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, did a survey on California's uh, red flag laws. Uh, after 10 years, he proved that it had zero uh, effect on homicides and suicide rates. So red flag laws that are proposed, proposed to do that don't do that. Uh, anybody that is red flag lawed, the police come to your house and they take your guns and they leave you alone. Uh, they tell you that if you're a threat to yourself or others, that's why they do that. Problem is, they take your guns and they leave you alone. If there's no mental health aspect, if there's nothing else going on, you're not doing anything. You still have your guns. No, you don't. You still have your knives, your axes, uh, your car keys, your gasoline, your rope. You can still harm yourself. You can still harm others. So it has nothing to do with public safety. That is purely a gun grab as far as that goes. Uh, defensive gun use. The CDC, and this is ironic because they never published this uh, survey, but the CDC said defensive gun uses are 2 million times a year. That's 7,000 times a day law-abiding citizens use a gun to prevent a robbery, crime, murder, anything else. Uh, the vast majority of those, the triggers never pull. Just seeing the firearm is enough for a bad guy to decide he needs to go somewhere else. 90% of convicted felons said that they will not attack or try to make a victim out of anybody that's armed. 40% said they wouldn't even go after anybody that they thought was armed. So that tells you how their thought process on picking victims. Uh, the assault weapons ban, you hear a lot of that talked about, uh, this new proposal, the Clinton assault weapon ban. Uh, that ran from 94, sunset in 04. The lowest number of murders uh, caused by rifles during the Clinton assault weapon ban was 384. Last year, many years after the assault weapon ban went away, was 297. So almost 100 less after that with no assault weapons ban. Uh, and we all know they're scary guns things. Uh, we know how many more of those weapons are out there now than there were back then, significantly more. So again, it's not the gun. Uh, the universal crime report, uniform crime report that the FBI put out says that crime is down 70%. Violent crime is down 50% in the last 40 years. And again, what has happened to private firearm owners ownership in that length of time? It has skyrocketed way more. So that proves guns are not the problem. Um, Really funny, there was, uh, I was watching somebody the other day, I believe it was Mr. Anderson, said uh, that Northam had the chance to uh, 
signed a bill banning sanctuary cities for the illegals, and he refused to ban sanctuary cities. This kind of turned around and bit him at the butt, hasn't it? So, so much for that. The only other thing I'd like to leave with you, a couple of things. Uh, 16 states currently are constitutional carry states, which means if you're not prohibited from owning a gun, you can put a gun in your pocket and go anywhere you want to. 16 states. Virginia's going in the opposite direction. That seems like, I don't know, not really the smartest thing to do, to use city council friendly language. Uh, let's see, I'd also like to uh, uh, help people uh, or, or get people to join the VCDL, Virginia Citizens Defense League. They'll be fighting the, uh, the laws that are coming along. Uh, also, the uh, Second Amendment. Um, can't remember the name of that. Hopefully, somebody will know. Um, and then the NRA, what's left of the NRA. Hopefully, everybody will get, uh, get membership to support them. They're the guys who are going to be fighting for us. So that's about it. Thank you, folks. And uh, hopefully, we get a positive outcome on the resolution. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Uh, next, I have uh, Marissa White. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry I'm not a public speaker, so please bear with me. That's all right. Most of us aren't either. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Marissa White, and I can tell you my name all day long. But at the end of the day, I'll just be another face in the crowd. I'll be someone that you won't remember someone wanting to, remember, to support our rights and abilities to protect ourselves. You might not remember me in five seconds, but you will remember me when you see my face smiling at you from a newspaper in an article describing an attack made against me, or even an obituary. You would see candlelit services, memorials, Facebook posts, all because I was unable to protect myself. We were given our Second Amendment rights in order to protect ourselves from threats both foreign and domestic. It would be immoral and illegal to revoke the amendment like this. The laws coming out of Richmond would only affect those of us who actually abide by them. Most of the criminals, the laws are, sorry. <laughs> Most of the criminals the laws are meant to stop will not be affected by these laws. They'll only make the rest of us easier targets. So should these bills be allowed to pass and we as a community do not stand up against them, you will see my face in the newspaper. You'll see my pictures on Facebook. You'll see memorials, and I hope you remember who I am. I hope you remember the young woman who only wanted to feel safe. The average national response time for priority one calls is 10 minutes. A priority one call is a police call where if they do not get there in a timely manner, there may be serious injury, death, property loss, anything could happen. This is rape, this is murder, this is burglary, arson anything along those lines. That's 10 minutes from the time of them getting notified. 10 minutes of time for anything to happen to me. That requires a call to be made. I might not have access to my cell phone if I am running and screaming through the parking lots, being chased by someone who wants to hurt me. I am a small woman. I am one of the easiest looking targets out there. This is Christmas, a time where people are walking alone to their cars. I don't want my family to see what I'm buying for them for Christmas. That would ruin all the fun. So when I'm coming out of Patrick Henry Mall with my gifts in my hands and my car keys held in my grasp, no way to defend myself when someone approaches me from behind, that is when you see me in the newspaper. That is also relying on someone to hear my screams, hearing me call for help that might not even come. <sighs> 10 minutes for anything to happen. 10 minutes of me maybe lying on the ground for my parents to maybe wonder, where is she at? Why isn't she answering her phone? Thank you for supporting our Second Amendment and for supporting the safety of our community. I ask you to vote yes for us to become a constitutional city and to support our safety. she could be a public speaker. <laughs> All right, uh, Brian White. 
Yeah, tough act to follow. That's my little sister. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the Pocosin City Council. My name is Brian White, and I am a Pocosin native. I'm 24 years old, an Army National Guard service member of four years in the service, specializing in combat arms and field artillery operations. I am a trained sheriff's deputy with the city of Chesapeake and a citizen who is concerned about his safety of his God-given rights under the United States Constitution. I stand before you today to express my absolute displeasure with our state government, how they believe a single election cycle gives them infinite authority to walk over us in our way of life, and the insane and dangerous legislation they are attempting to pass so very shortly after getting a majority in the state government. I am especially concerned over the current attack on our Second Amendment rights, which have come under fire without any warning by our governor. As you might be aware, many counties across the state are electing to become safe zones for firearm ownership, and I would like to see my own hometown do the same. <clears throat> sure, some sort of gun control may look really, really special on paper, but in reality, it's a far different situation. Let's look at some places that have enacted gun control on their populations. Los Angeles, Chicago, Camden, New Jersey, Portland, or even Detroit. But what do all these places share in common outside of an interest in gun control? an extremely high crime rate and murder rate among its populations, defenseless populations. Firearms under attack because criminals that would not have been stopped by any laws claimed just over 190 lives in 2018 in mass shootings alone. But does anybody know the Center Disease Control found in a study that firearms use between two and three million times a year to prevent a crime? Or that a firearm is very easily able to even the playing field between somebody like my little sister who just spoke versus somebody my size who wish to do her harm. I feel like I must speak out on this matter because regardless of how much personal experience and expertise I might have on firearms, what matters to me is what they exist to do. Firearms are merely a tool. They do not represent intent. They do not represent violence. They do not commit harm by themselves. They represent a means of defense for those who need to be defended, which should be every single person in this room. <clears throat> Defense from a home invasion, defense from a mugger, or defense from a tyrannical government looking to remove your God-given rights. This is where the Second Amendment is about. Liberty and safety can only be obtained through actions, not legislation. And a gun will not be stopped by that law. Let's take in a note that Virginia has a legal limit on drinking so that we can catch and arrest those committing DUI. Does this stop DUI in any way? Have any DUIs been prevented by a legal limit on drinking? No. The only true solution to stopping DUI entirely in the state is to take every single car from every single household across the entire country. No more cars, no more DUIs. But we cannot afford to do that. Transportation and commerce are much too valuable to our modern society. Yet at the same time, we can revoke people's access to firearms they desire. Not because they've broken any laws, not because they're a personal threat, but because it's a convenience for the government to remove your rights. They believe they can afford to cost you your peace of mind and protection in exchange for a narrative that has only caused issues, never solved them. They desire to target the AR-15, calling it a weapon of war. As a soldier myself, and as any soldier would gladly contest, you would be an absolute fool to carry an AR-15 into a war zone. They are not military rifles. They are not combat rated, and they are not combat capable. They are not assault rifles. Meanwhile, over 90% of all mass shootings have occurred in gun-free zones, conducted with handguns or shotguns, not AR-15s, leaving the people within the gun-free zones helpless and defenseless, lambs to the slaughter of politics, while those we elect continue to cry that we need to take more guns away from law-abiding citizens to solve the issue. Let's look at something closer to home, the municipal shooting in Virginia Beach, a mass shooting that took place on our back doorstep that still lives within our hearts to this very day. Does anyone here seriously believe the staff in that building were safer because the government wouldn't allow guns inside the building? Does anyone here think for a second that those inside didn't wish they had the Second Amendment access when somebody with no concern for the law was barreling down on them? Gun control is not a solution to a problem, but instead a start of a problem in itself. It violates the Constitution, a document both yourselves and myself swore to uphold, and endangers everybody who is forced to abide by the policy. Because all gun control does is harm the law-abiding citizen, the only one who will obey the law. This means the criminal, someone with no intention to follow your laws in the first place, is left with a turkey shoot of defenseless people, people, who, <clears throat> people which those who support gun control have no problem sacrificing as long as they get their way when it comes to the legislation. So now I urge you to heavily consider our desires. Understand that this isn't for the mere love of guns. This isn't just to send a message to Richmond. This is about our safety our genuine concern for our families in our hometown, and that we will fight for our rights as Virginians always have. From the Revolutionary War and beyond, we are a state of freedom. We are a state of fighters, and a state that won't sit back quietly and let ourselves be walked upon by politicians. 
We are Virginians. We are Pocosanites. And we deserve the Constitution to live freely under no attack by Democrats, the way our nation was intended to be run by our founding fathers. Do not tread on me, and God bless America. Okay, uh, Shannon Dallimore? Dalrymple. Dalrymple. Good evening. Hey, sorry, I really am not a public speaker. And can we all talk about what's really important right now? It's very hot back there. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking tonight. I just happened to call my dad on the way here, and daddy said, Shannon, stand up. So a little background, my father is a former Border Patrol agent, 30 years, all his life, basically all my life. Um, he was a firearms instructor. So I grew up with guns all my life in the liberal state of California. I never feared guns, never had a problem with them because, you know, father-daughter days, every time we went out, I had pictures of me at six years old on a, like, sandbag shooting in the desert at Cairns. I went to the gun range with my father. I went on take your daughter to work days with my father. Never had an issue with guns. They were always in a safe. There was a giant safe in the garage. There was safes under the bed. Everything was taken care of. Never worried about it. Today I'm worried about it. And not because someone doesn't have them in a the safe, but because someone wants to take them out of his safe. We moved to the East Coast about 10 years ago. I'm here in Virginia, but he moved to this side of the country too. And someone wants to take guns from someone like him, who protected this country in a different kind of way, not the military, but still, for 30 years. They would like to take his weapons. Granted, Daddy taught me how to shoot a machine gun too. Sorry, fellas, I could probably shoot better than most of you. <laughs> But it wasn't in a way that was, let's go shoot up the mall. It was just, let me teach you how to do this. And I don't actually own any guns in my house now, but that doesn't matter. He matters. People like him matters. Everyone in this room matters. And honestly, we haven't really talked about much why the Second Amendment was made in the first place tonight. Before the Revolutionary War, the English wanted to take our guns, and we fought back. We said hell no and didn't give them our guns. We had a militia, and we took over, and we did what we needed to do. If we didn't do that, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be America. So what happens today when they want to take our guns? From people like my father. Do we just sit back and let them do it? I know stuff as stupid as Facebook doesn't matter right now, but I saw a meme today on Facebook, and it was some Englishman, and he said, why do the English care about your guns? And we said, oh, because you'd be German right now. That matters. That makes sense, doesn't it? So anyway, so I wasn't planning on speaking tonight, but there it is. Don't take my daddy's guns. All right. Thank you. And... This matters. All right, Jonathan Cruz. Mr. Mayor and ladies and gentlemen of the City Council, I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, came with scribbled notes on the back because I wasn't aware of the meeting until on the way home from work tonight. Um, I am a lifelong uh, citizen resident of Virginia, and I've lived in Pocosin for nearly 30 years now. Always, been, You have, probably haven't seen me at any of these meetings. I've always been happy with how you've run the city, and this has been the first issue that I've been so concerned that I, although I've been really uh, enheartened to hear the proposal before you, 
that I'm here to speak in support of. I just felt the need to come and have my voice heard. Um, I've uh, an upstanding, tax-paying, law-abiding citizen, retired from NASA, working for a government contractor, long-term government clearance, and I resent the implication that I'm a criminal um, who's not to be trusted with the rights guaranteed me by both the U.S. and the Virginia constitutions. Um, I'm disheartened by the state proposals to ban or take my legally acquired and utilized property and would ask how these proposed laws would impact the criminals, those who by definition do not obey the law. Um, after hearing some of the previous speakers, I thought I'd share uh, one of the personal stories with me. When I was growing up, um, I'd grown up without my parents shooting. My father had to work a lot. I started um, doing uh, competitions on my own and wondered what my father's um, perception of that would be. We had a discussion one night at the dinner table where um, we were discussing some proposed registration, and um, he came out very strongly in a very personal, moving story to me. In background, he was born on Guam before the war. Um, the United States had taken over Guam as part of the spoils of war with the Spanish-American War. It was run by a military governor, and they allowed the natives, of which my father was one, to have certain firearms, but the firearms had to be registered. Every single round of ammunition had to be registered. And to be able to get additional ammunition, you had to turn in the empty cases one for one to get additional. When the Japanese attacked, they attacked at the same moment they attacked um, Hawaii, but they landed at Guam and they took it over. They quickly overcame the Marines that were guarding it, except for a few that some of my father's family hid. And then uh, many of the natives had to hide in the jungle to try to protect their lives. I mean, my father has stories of he, his eight brothers and sisters and his parents hiding in the roots of a banyan tree in the jungle waiting for the fighting to end. Um, his uncle did have firearms, but knew that with the full-on assault of the Japanese, this was not the time to fight them if they'd already overcome the U.S. Marines. So he hid his guns and his ammunition in the jungle for the time when it would be more appropriate to use them. Um, weeks passed, and then suddenly a, an armed Japanese squad marched up to my uncle's farm. And they lined up my uncle and his family, and they said, Mr. Cruz, we have these forms from the U.S. military governor that says you have these guns and this ammunition. Give them to us. My uncle tried to stall, he said, um, in in the confusion of the, of the invasion, you know, I've misplaced them. I don't know where they are. And they said, that's fine, Mr. Cruz. We'll give you an hour to find them. If you don't find them, we will kill one of your family members. Every half hour thereafter, we will kill another family member until none are left and you have no one to use the guns or you bring the guns back. So he had to bring the guns back. And, you know, that stuck with me that my father, who I'd never realized just how firmly convicted he was that we needed to protect our rights, and within his lifetime, he has seen the need to protect those rights. And I feel we're at a point here in our state where we need to protect our rights. Um, so, again, I just want to encourage you as my elected representatives um, to speak up on my and my neighbor's behalf um, and um, declare Pocosin as a Second Amendment sanctuary. And so we can send a message to the state, to the nation, that we stand as in, in support of the Constitution and our rights. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, sir. Rosemary Allen. Hi, good evening, council members. My name is Rosemary Allen, and I have been a Bacosan resident for 34 years. I've been a small business owner in the city for 18 years as well. I grew up in a military household where guns were allowed, but they weren't owned. My ex-husband owned guns, and that's when everything changed. I, had two, I have two sons that are hunters, and one of my sons carries a pistol for him for protection. I was involved in a physical, domestic situation where my son's gun ultimately, being present, saved my life. There were ramifications for firing the gun, but 
my life was worth that penalty. Several years later, I witnessed a woman shoot and kill her wife. When I was in a safe place, I contacted the police department and I was asked why I fled the scene. My answer, she had a gun and I didn't. Soon after that, I vowed never to be in that situation again. I learned to shoot, I took the required courses, and I purchased the weapon legally. My home has always had guns in it, but I never felt the need to carry one until my life was in danger. There are so many stories around this room that are similar to mine. If we do not have the right to own guns, some of us would not be here. We as citizens of this great country have the right to protect ourselves, our families, our belongings, as well as tools to provide food in the means of hunting. I urge the council to provide its citizens with sanctuary from this law. We as a whole are a peaceful city. Can you imagine the chaos in this city if this city had no way to protect itself? I, for one, do not want to test those waters. As much as I respect them, and as amazing as our police force is, they cannot be everywhere all the time. Thank you for your time and consideration. All right, uh, Christopher Montraga. Good evening, members of the City Council. God, there's a lot of people in here. Uh, I had something prepared. Uh, I left it at home. I chose not to speak, and my, my big brother talked me into it. Uh, I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm an active duty Navy Chief Petty Officer. I'm an avid hunter, and I'm an avid gun enthusiast. I say those in no particular order, but as a father... I carry on the tradition that my father showed me and my brother on how to use a weapon, on how to hunt, on how to provide for my family with that, and I do so actively. I refuse to go buy beef at the grocery store. I choose to go out and get my, get my dinner. I'm a husband, and I teach my wife and my children on how to protect themselves. I moved to Pocosin about seven years ago after my pregnant wife had to defend my home while I was away in Jacksonville, Florida. Me taking the time to train my wife on how to actively use a weapon and employ it for her safety is the only reason why three intruders made it not into my house, but my neighbor's house, unfortunately. I took solace in the fact that I trained my wife and taught her how to use it safely, and she knew exactly how to do so when the time counted. Also teaching her how to come home and surprise her when she's eight months pregnant. <laughs> there are laws before the state legislature that make the very act of me training my wife or training my son, who is probably more safe with his Daisy Red Rider BB gun than some people will ever be, because that's how I train him. But the very act of me doing that and congregating with family and friends to train the generation that is coming up will be illegal and make me a felon. I took the time to read every law that's gone before the Senate, and that strikes down a lot of tradition whether you're arguing for an assault weapons ban or whether you're arguing for that semi-automatic shotgun that's going to follow you under the duck blind and have, have your son there and your dog and have those memories for a lifetime, there's a lot of things that are at stake here. And regardless of whether it's on the docket right now for the session in January or whether it's something coming forward, our rights are at, are, are at risk. They're being threatened. The very thing that protected us for very many years and set us apart from any country in the world is the very thing that is becoming threatened in Virginia. It has been contemplated in other states, but in Virginia, where it all started. We settled here. We started and we, we moved on. We, we expanded. We became a nation of 50 great states. And where it started, we're facing the risk of losing everything. Losing the ability to defend myself, to train my family, to go out and shoot a deer or a duck with any gun that I choose as long as it's legal by the good laws that are right there already, and it keeps me safe. I know that I can go home and grab one out of the gun safe and go use it safely and still be a law-abiding citizen. And I may not be that law-abiding citizen with what is before, before the state legislature now. I ask that you please move forward and support our rights as a community. I moved to Pocosin because this community was a safer community. I lived in Hampton when my house was broken or attempted to be broken into. I will say that in 2017, there was a string of break-ins break in Pocosin. 
and that person did not target a single home but an outside dwelling. And I can say with almost assurance that he probably didn't want to go in a single house in Pocosin because there was a fair chance that there was a weapon behind that door with a trained individual. Some people in this room are probably affected by that. I know he probably didn't want to go, come into my house. Unfortunately, you know, I did lose some things in my garage, but he didn't step foot in my house and my family was safe and they were trained to be safe. I trained my children, I trained my wife. I'm a chief petty officer in the Navy. I trained thousands of sailors throughout, I've trained thousands of sailors throughout my career. These are my points and I won't say that they're over the Navy, but I will say that I am a weapons department chief petty officer. It is my job every day to work with firearms and be safe. And I take that home, I take it to my family, I take it to my friends to teach them the same. We're at a very big threat moving forward and it starts here with the amount of people that we have here to stand before this body and say, please support our rights to protect ourselves, to train our families, to maintain the peace and solace that we have. If we lose that, where does it go from there? I ask that you please support this constitutional su supporting document moving forward, and that way we can maintain our rights, maintain our ability to become the, or to still be the great city of Pocosin, and have our privileges before us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and I have to go back. I did miss one. Michael LaWall? Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, City Manager, City Council members. My name is Michael LaWall. I've been a city resident for 20-some years. Uh, I live on Framing Drive. Um, I'm a retired Mass Chief Petty Officer, uh, Gunners Make Guns. Uh, I've been in the Navy for 20 years. I'm a Gulf War vet. Um, the only thing I really want to say is these laws, uh, the way they're written, they're talking about items. Items don't kill people. It's the people with their heart, and that's what causes these actual uh, incidents. It's the animus in somebody's heart. Anybody can use anything to kill anybody else. And that, I think, is the real problem. And I know everybody else has talked about so many other things, but the only thing I know is that you know the hearts of the community here. All I can say is vote your heart. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and that's all the planned speakers that we have this evening. I, I will tell you that... Uh, as a group, you conducted yourselves very, very well. Uh, I'm very pleased with what was said as well as how it was said. And I, I urge you all to stick together and to continue to push the way that you are uh, because it makes a difference how you approach this. You know, I. I've told people I don't want to do anything like the city of San Francisco. That's why we're the city of Pocosin, right? Second Amendment sanctuaries to protect me from a legal, uh, I don't like what the government's doing is, is not right. What's right is not, not allowing the government to do what you're exactly saying this evening. I think you're on the right track. Uh, I, I will follow this movement as you make your way to Richmond and beyond. Had if this comes uh, to fruition, as I know this council will. But thank you for what you've said this evening. Uh, there's not one single thing here that was said that, for me personally, I could counter any of those arguments. They were all very well said. And uh, a couple new public speakers as well. So I uh, really appreciate that and the way that you handled yourselves. And it's a model for what the people in Richmond should be doing and focusing on and how they address each other and the people in DC should be doing that we elect that are supposed to work together uh, and don't do a very good job of that. But thank you for those comments and, uh, and that audience for visitors. I'm very pleased with that. I'll move the uh, meeting on to audience for, uh, not for audience for visitors, but approval of the minutes. 
we'll dispatch with this very closely and get right into the resolution. So, Council? Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve the minutes of the regular session of November the 12th, 2019. Second. Second. Okay, motion made and second. We approve the regular session minutes of November 12th. Questions or comments of Council? Seeing none, Evie, please. Certainly. Councilman Hux. Aye. Councilman Southall. Aye. Vice Mayor Freeman. Aye. Councilman Green. Aye. Councilwoman Andrews. Aye. Councilman Canella. Aye. Mayor Hunt. Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote of 7 0. And the work session? Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve the minutes of the work session of the same night. Second. A motion is made and seconded that we approve that as well. Questions or comments? Seeing none, Evie, please. Vice Mayor Freeman. Aye. Councilwoman Andrews. Aye. Councilman Southall. Aye. Councilman Canella. Aye. Councilman Hux. Aye. Councilman Green. Aye. Mayor Hunt. Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote of 7 0. Okay, under new business, item one. This is a resolution supporting the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia. It's been read by Evie. Is there a motion to move forward with this item? Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt a resolution of the Constitution of the City Council to support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Second. 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 With a uh, technical amendment, if I may, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just ask that... Following this motion, uh, the following amendment be included. Uh, in the third paragraph, the words to be are inserted after legislation and before introduced, and that 2019 be stricken and 2020 inserted in its place so that the first sentence of the third paragraph reads, whereas certain legislation to be introduced in the 2020 session of the Virginia General Assembly, comma. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I'll modify my motion. <clears throat> Thank you. And the second? Second. All right. All right. Comments of counsel. We have a motion made and seconded on the floor. Mr. Hux. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as a representative of the fine <coughs> citizen of Pocosa, and I feel that it's important for me to share my point of view on this issue that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, like so many others here tonight, I was born and raised in this area. Uh, by gun-owning, gun-bearing, hunting families. I was taught from a very early age by my father safe and responsible gun handling. The same lessons taught him by his father, his father before him, and I've been very pleased that my wife, Teresa, and I have passed on those same lessons to our two daughters. So far as my stance on the Constitution, I am a staunch originalist. As I interpret the Constitution, the Constitution, which I believe was developed with divine inspiration by the Founding Fathers, who had an acute understanding of human nature, which never changes. It remains constant since Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The Constitution was written to address this human nature and guarantees the God-given rights which cannot be rescinded by human governments. Testimony to the greatness of this Constitution is the fact that it has only been amended 17 times since the first 10 amendments, better known as the Bill of Rights, were ratified in 1791. It's the best in the world. And I'd like to clarify or make it clear my understanding of some myths uh, that we hear so much about today. And y'all will recognize some themes that are constant, and I will reinforce what some folks have already said tonight. Uh, contrary to popu popular belief, uh, an AR-15 is not an assault rifle. It is an Armalite rifle, Model 15, just like my pickup truck is a Ford Model F-150. <laughs> There is no such thing as gun violence. There is no such thing as knife violence, nor is there such thing as blunt object violence. And despite, tragically, the thousands of people are injured and killed every year by drunk drivers, there's no such thing as alcohol 
violence. The violence stems from that human nature, as previously mentioned, and that's where the laws need to be focused. And based on these words, I am proud to support the resolution before us tonight. And y'all's attendance here tonight makes me proud to be a resident and a representative, and I uh, do appreciate y'all's presence tonight. Uh, please call on me and us at any time. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Mayor, if yes, I sir. could. Um, I'm not going to reiterate what's been said. I think I'll say 99% of us in this room watching from home and in the overflow room feels the same way about this. I know I do. Um, I just want to emphasize, and I know everyone here knows this, but don't, don't be satisfied. This is not a time to be satisfied at all. This fight and your energy and your patriotism has to go to Richmond very soon um, because a very different uh, Commonwealth is looming over <coughs> us. And come next July 1st, you might not even recognize it. And that is scary and something I know no one in this room is looking forward to. So um, I know January 20th is the date that's been set uh, for, for this group uh, to be in Richmond and show your support. But before then, start contacting Delegate-elect Mugler and Senator Tommy Norman, our representatives, Call the folks and understand the committees will change, but call other delegates, call other senators, send the entire General Assembly an email. The worst they can do is not look at it, but I can assure you their staff is, and I can assure you their staff is going to say, Senator or Delegate, this is how many emails we've received in support and how many against. Um, and I I'm going to be on this fight with you, and I certainly hope I see uh, every face in this room in Richmond on January 20th because it's a, uh, it's a fight take worth driving an hour for and, and taking a day off work. So uh, I hope to see you there, and I, can, I think I can speak on behalf of this council that we're doing all we can do, and we will continue to do that and, until this, this stuff is stopped. Yep. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I just wanted to commend everybody that came out. I have the utmost respect for people that choose to get involved in their government because it doesn't happen often. Um, I know you guys probably all had better things to do tonight than, than be here or other things that you could do tonight. Um, and the fact that you chose to come here and speak um, means a lot. Um, and uh, as Thomas said, I would encourage you to not, if this is something that you believe in, I can tell you this isn't enough. You have to go speak before those committees. You have to write your delegates. You have to call your delegates. You have to go to Richmond. Um, too many times I think people are complacent and think if they post on social media or they come to a meeting like this and speak out that things will change. Um, and, and that isn't the case. And I think a lot of people are apathetic. And I've heard over and over again, my, my legislators don't listen to me. It's not going to make a difference. But I've seen... I've seen it make a difference, and people can make a difference. Us as a legislative body don't vote in those legislators. You do. Um, so I would encourage you to contact those legislators, whether you think it's going to make a difference or not. Um, and again, I appreciate you coming out. I do agree with Mr. Hux when he says that our laws do need to focus on the people that have the guns. As a mother of a daughter who was at Virginia Tech in 2007, I know what it feels like when somebody that shouldn't have a gun has one. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, I, I would like to thank everyone who came out here tonight and those at home who are paying attention, but especially those here tonight who spoke. Okay? Uh, I share most of the sentiments, but every sentiment that's been expressed so far, and I couldn't say the words any better than Councilman David Huck said. Uh, I want to stress the same thing that Jana just said and, 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 uh, and let you know that I have made my phone calls and I have written my letters. And I hope everyone here does that. You can't, this, being here tonight is not enough. You need to make your phone calls. You need to send your emails. Okay? 
and it will get congested, and you need to swamp them with letters, okay? Do not stop here. I ask for every one of you to support your rights, okay, and show up in Richmond to give your letters and your phone calls. And thank you for being here tonight. Good. Mr. Vice Mayor. Just a quick comment. I agree that we really appreciate y'all coming out, and you do need to take this to Richmond. But just for a point of information, and I did check this and verify it, our police, fire, and rescue have about average of a three-minute response time in our city. And compare that to the numbers you heard for statewide and national. I'm just really proud of those folks. I still think you ought to have your gun there, but our police do good. That's fine. So, Councilman Green, you've been, you you want to take a take a turn? No, I don't want to belabor this any further. Let everybody know how I feel. <laughs> All right, I have a motion made and seconded that we proceed with the resolution that was read earlier. Evie, please. Councilman Green. Aye. Councilman Hux. A very adamant aye. Councilman Canella. Aye. Councilman Southall. Another very adamant aye. Councilwoman Andrews. Aye. Vice Mayor Freeman. Aye. And Mayor Hunt. Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote of seven to zero. Okay. Um, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to step out of order just a little bit. I'm going to take a five-minute recess. For, so for those of you that don't want to listen to the more mundane things of government, which would include uh, talking about our financial advisor and redoing his contract, um, uh, doing AV room modernization, uh, I'll give you all, all a chance to, to do your thing. So we'll take five minutes here. All right. Yeah, I know, I'm glad. <laughs> 
I'm glad I didn't get to go first before all the people left. That would have been awful. <laughs> That would have been something I could have done to you. But I know, you could have done that. I could have done that and said, hey, you could have, well, you could have, that would have been this toying is, with all the people in here, is, making them is, listen to the this multi-use. Is, this would have been like, this, has, this, this is all for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I would, I think the, I would crowd, do that. the crowd might have gotten a little restless they, they probably would have had to listen to me something. talk about I was like, uh, I was like melting, past. so I didn't want to be here one more Oh my minute. god, it was so hot. How did that work out? Um, so we were able to accommodate <laughs> good, about, good. It's good it was to see you. about 50, 55 that couldn't yeah. get into the room. We turned on the TVs behind our oh. Um, desk. Oh, wow. We, um, How many do you have in your room? 50 or 55? About 60 in the room and another 50, 55 in the library just standing. Oh, wow. Um, Oh, wow. Thank you so much. So, wow. We, yeah, we were like, we have a cable that was behind the box to sit on the shelf, but it had been put behind them. I expect to be great from the white was for you. Thank you. The whole job. Oh, yeah. I was paying a lot. Well, your prayers were answered. Thank you. Well, it's good when you have something to believe in. How are you doing? It makes all the difference. Yes, sir. It does. It makes it easy. Did it work? Okay, we can go back on air. All right, uh, we're back from our five-minute adjournment, uh, and I'll, item number two under new business is a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into any and all agreements dealing with the South Lawson Park multi-use path project. Mr. Mayor, members of council, um, Garrett Figgins is here from our engineering department to uh, present a, a brief summary of this and answer your questions. This is something we've been working on really since before I got here. It's just, it, it finally popped out of, um, of this funding black hole in VDOT and uh, now we're trying to, uh, to get it done. Very good. All right. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the mayor for that five-minute recess so I don't have to speak in front of a, a very large <laughs> audience. That makes my job a lot easier. <laughs> but uh, So this project is uh, in, installing a, a multi-use path, which is used for uh, both uh, pedestrian and biking down at, uh, down at South Lawson Park. Uh, we uh, received uh, money, this is federal money, through the uh, Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Program. Uh, the money is available now in fiscal year 2020, and so we consulted with the uh, Parks and Rec uh, Advisory Board on where the uh, where the uh, multi-use path should go, and we agreed that the the best place would be for the uh, for the uh, multi-use path to, um, to to replace the current gravel path down there. As the went during storm events, the uh, gravel path can become quite muddy and unwalkable, and uh, so attached to the um, uh, you should have a uh, have a copy of the uh, outline of where we are looking to put the uh, put the multi-use path. 
And uh, so attached for the city council's uh, consideration, there's a, a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into agreements with VDOT, which will allow us to proceed with the project. Yep. Uh, the only question I have, the multi surface path or whatever, what surface is it going to be? Uh, it's gra um, gravel. No. No, not gravel. Asphalt. I, asphalt, asphalt. yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you uh, for that clarification. Is there anybody prepared with a motion? And then we'll have discussion. Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into any and all agreements dealing with the South Lawson Park multi-use path project. Second. Second. Motion made and second that we uh, approve this resolution. And uh, actually, I'd lost track of this thing. You're right. It's been forever. Um, questions or comments of council on this while we have him at the podium? That's a silent group. You did a really nice job. All right. Uh, Evie, let's go ahead and go. Uh, what you hate? Hmm, me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Councilman Canella. Aye. Councilwoman Andrews. Aye. Councilman Green. Aye. Vice Mayor Freeman. Uh -huh. Councilman Southall. Aye. Councilman Hux. Aye. Mayor Hunt. Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote of 7 0. Okay, the next one is an item. It's a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract for financial services with Davenport and Company, LLC. Can you check your microphone? The red light's on. There it is. Okay. Got to start I again. Hear, I guess I'm so loud I could hear myself, so I apologize. So I'm going to repeat for the audience listening at home and for city council members. Um, we do have Kyle Lux here in the audience from Davenport. They have been our financial advisors for many years. As we move on to the second phase of our borrowing, we need to continue that advisory service with Davenport. They have been very instrumental with our operations. So tonight I have brought to you a di little different um, a cooperative language with the County of Dinwiddie, which allows us to enter into a contract for one year with four one-year extensions. This will allow staff as well as the city to get the services that we need to continue the operations of debt borrowing and anything else. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Kyle, I'm not going to let you drive down from Richmond and not come up to the podium so people can <laughs> see you. Okay. And let me, let me first say that, you know, uh, Davenport and Company have been one of the great partners of the city of Pocosum. You are, you and your advice, as well as our staff and our city manager, uh, leading us down the right financial road has made uh, life in this city very, very good for our citizens. We've done things together like uh, debt borrowings. I will tell you, uh, if folks at home that are looking and saying, what about that Pocosin Middle School? This is the reason, uh, a lot of the advice that we get from Davenport is the reason that we do have the money to do the middle school already uh, in our coffers or uh, with those additional things. So thank you for what you do. And I'm sorry that then I brought you up and then didn't say, hey, how are you doing? Said, <laughs> well, if I could, Mr. Mayor, I just did want, to, want to say thank you. And certainly we'd, we appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, I think I've done this for, I think, 17 years. Um, years kind of tick by pretty quickly. And I think I've worked with Bacos in that entire time period. So we really appreciate it. Um, and certainly it's been a joy to work with as a city and between uh, the middle school, elementary school, other things, we really appreciate it. So um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, you all want to just congratulate him like I did, or do you want him to sit down? I think congratulations is enough. Enough said. Right. Thank you. We appreciate hey, thank it. Thank you for taking yeah. the time to come down here this evening. All right. Uh, is the motion to move forward? 
Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract for financial advisory services with Davenport and Company, LLC. Second. Second. Okay, motion main second that we approve the resolution. Evie, please. Certainly. Councilwoman Andrews. Aye. Councilman Canella. Aye. Councilman Southall. Aye. Vice Mayor Freeman. Aye. Councilman Hux. Aye. Councilman Green. Aye. Mayor Hunt. Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote of 7 0. Okay. The next item is an ordinance making additional transfers for the audiovisual room modernization for fiscal year 2020 in the capital project fund. Okay. So tonight presented before you is an ordinance just making additional transfers. We had a little bit of money saved over from two of our projects. In order to upgrade the um, system here, we need an additional $15,456. Um, currently, if this is passed tonight, our hopes is to enter into a contract with them. Um, and it's under a cooperative agreement as well, and it's under the threshold that the city manager can sign the contract. Um, and if so, our hopes is to begin December 18th, um, which means if we do get that successfully, and I don't know if Josh nodding his head yes or no, we've got to figure that out. But once we do, we'll keep you up to date. This will help with a lot of our streaming to YouTube and so forth in high definition. Um, I should also point out that the original ordinance that was presented had a typo arrow, error. Um, so we are actually taking, instead of taking from the high school HVAC replacement, it's actually coming from equipment replacement. Um, so Councilman Hux brought it to my attention, but I already beat it to him. So it was a test and he passed with flying colors. So with that further ado, I do have that ordinance in front of you if you have any questions. Randy, you got some? I do. Um, as you'll recall, in, in August at the, at the council's retreat, one of the things that you uh, encouraged us to do is to find a path forward for this AV system. So this is the last piece of the funding. Not only do we think it'll start as early as next week, but it's our expectation, if you approve this funding, that by the time you get together at your next regularly scheduled meeting, that the system upgrade will be either largely complete or hopefully completely complete. And once we get through that work, all that through, then we will turn our attention to the second thing you challenged us to do in that conversation, which is actually start working at of capacity and capability improvements of our TV channel itself. So this is the building block we'll build off of this. We know we're not done, but this is an important next step for us. Does this mean I won't get a text during a meeting or yes, hear my husband when I get home say, That's I couldn't hear what objective. anybody said at the podium? Yes, ma'am. Does this mean that we'll look better on TV? <laughs> I cannot answer that. <laughs> Make my hair look black. <laughs> okay. Council, there's a motion here on our uh, on the desk here. If we can use that motion to move forward. Thanks. Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt the revised ordinance making additional transfers for AV room for physical year 2020 in capital project fund. Second. All right. Motion made second. Any questions or comments? Okay. Evie, please. Certainly. Councilman Southall. Aye. Vice Mayor Freeman. Aye. Councilman Hux. Aye. Councilman, Councilman Green. Aye. Councilman Canella? Aye. Councilwoman Andrews? Aye. Mayor Hunt? Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote of 7 0. Okay, last item under new business is a resolution making an appointment to the Board of Zoning Appeals. Somebody prepared to make a motion. Mr. Mayor, on behalf of Vice Mayor Freeman, I would like to make a motion to move the appointment of the Board of Zoning Appeals to the first meeting in January 2020. Second. Okay, motion made and seconded. Uh, questions or comments? Okay, Evie? Certainly. Councilman Hux? Aye. Counts <clears throat> Excuse me, Councilman Southall? Aye. Vice Mayor Free? Aye. Councilman Green? Aye. Councilman Andrews? Aye. Councilman Canella? Aye. Mayor Hunt? Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote of 7-0. All right. On the home stretch here, Randy, comments of the city manager? 
Yes, sir. I have three. I'll go quick. He left already, but I just wanted to point out, you may not have seen it because he was sitting behind you, but I wanted to express thank you to Davenport for having their folks here at your 530 work session because eventually they're the people that are going to work on the financial plan and they wanted to hear what you were hearing and, and your initial reactions, so thank them. Uh, just a reminder, I, I said it earlier uh, during the work session, but if anyone would like uh, to see a full copy of the public safety uh, feasibility study, that is uh, linked on the city's website associated with tonight's meeting, as well as a hard copy in the library. And uh, lastly, just want to say thank you to everyone that helped with the uh, Tom Hunt store move. I was, I was pretty nervous and more paranoid than usual uh, because I had uh, horrible visions of something going badly and, and having a, a protracted choke point there. Um, and um, through the efforts of many people, that did not happen, and for which I am eternally thankful. And that's all I have. Okay. Thank you very much. Council Directives. Councilman Hux. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my thanks and compliments to Guernsey Tingle and the city staff who all worked together to provide a great feasibility study. And also, I'm very thankful to Pocosin City Council for the willingness to provide the funding to take the first step in the process towards the public safety building. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Green. One thing, Mr. Mayor, to remind everybody that the mobile food pantry is early this month. It will be a week from tomorrow, the 17th of December, same place, the old municipal building, and it's from 10 to 1. So it's a week, it's a week early. It'll be the third Tuesday instead of the fourth. So hope to see everybody there. Thank you. Okay. Councilman Canella. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the only thing I wanted to do tonight was uh, just congratulate uh, all the fall sports at Pocosin High School and our uh, youth leagues for uh, successful fall seasons and nothing additional. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Southall. Yes, I uh, would like one more time to thank everybody who came out tonight to speak and, and showed interest in their government. I sincerely hope that they will not forget and they will write their letters, they'll make their phone calls and they will show up in person because I think that's extremely important. Yeah. Councilwoman Andrews. Nothing additional. Okay. Mr. Vice Mayor. I just wanted to come in. Very, very nice uh, Christmas parade and uh, congratulate Pauls for having the number one float and uh, city management for setting up for the overflow crowd tonight. I thought that worked real well. Thank you. Uh, and just yeah. wish everybody out there a Merry Christmas. All right. I echo all those comments, and I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Mayor. Second. Second. Okay. Evie, please. Certainly. Vice Mayor Freeman. Aye. Councilwoman Andrews. Aye. Councilman Southall? Aye. Councilman Canella? Aye. Councilman Hux? Aye. Councilman Green? Aye. Mayor Hunt? Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote of 7-0. Okay, thank you very much, and we are adjourned.